Hello. Welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm talking with Kenneth Catania. Ken is a Stevenson Professor of Biological Sciences at Vanderbilt University. He's a 2006 MacArthur Fellow. He has a background in zoology and in neuroscience. And he is the author of Great Adaptations, Star-Nosed Moles, Electric Eels, and Other Tales of Evolution's Mysteries Solved. And that is what we talk about in this episode. Uh, I, I saw this book um, a while ago, and I finally got around to reading it. And I probably read it in, if not one sitting, definitely two sittings. Uh, it's not a long book. It's very digestible. And it's really good. Um, I've had plenty of folks on the podcast that talk about different aspects of, of biology and the natural world. And these were just some really, really interesting, almost case studies of some lesser known animals that uh, don't get talked about. We start the conversation by talking about how evolution helps, you know, many people understand these unique animals and seeing them as outliers, but trying to find other ways in which they converge. We talk about how moles are not quite different from other types of uh, mammals. We talk about the anatomy and features of the star-nosed mole. We talk about the importance of the neocortex in moles and shrews. We talk about how they work underwater and how they survive. We talk about the ways in which the tentacle snake eats fish. We talk about the uh, electric uh, eel and the mystery of the eel. The eel is a fascinating creature. And then we, towards the end of the conversation, we talk about the female jewel wasp that uh, makes zombies. It's a wild, wild story. And, you know, we have a lot of really cool application points in the conversation. And I have to say, you know, the natural world is a wild place. I mean, there's so many things that we don't know that we're still learning about. And, you know, we need, we need folks like Ken who are doing research, who are taking an interest in you know, maybe not the, the more commonly known uh, animals and their features to really tell us more about uh, the natural world and about life itself. And so now I bring you Ken Catania. I'm here with Kenneth Catania. Ken, how's it going? Thanks so Great. much for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to talking with you, um, I, hearing about your research and your work, but also we're going to probably mostly talk about your book. Uh, the book is Great Adaptations, Star-Nosed Moles, Electric Eels, and Other Tales of Evolution's Mystery Solved. And I was telling you, I, I read this in like two sittings. It, it was really good. It's uh, great uh, writing and the science is fantastic, so I, I can't recommend it enough. I, I learned a lot and it was, it was fantastic. Oh, thanks so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I was, <laughs> it's funny, you know, every, I feel like this, this happens in psychology too. We, so we, we, when you write scientific papers or when you have books, you have the title and then the subtitle is usually like, you know, 10 sentences long. It's just, that's how, it's just kind of how the science is. It's just hilarious to me how there's like this long, like subtitle afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We could have kept going actually. <laughs> we've looked at over the years. <laughs> yeah. So the, the book is great. So, I mean, obviously I, you know, on the podcast, I've talked with different people. Uh, biologists and paleontologists and a lot of different really cool folks. And um, so I've talked about evolution a lot. And one of the things that drew me to the book was talking about some of these uh, animals that are very interesting uh, diversions from uh, what we understand with natural selection and adaptation. You know, it's like, why would some of these animals have some really peculiar uh, ornaments or why would they have some peculiar like um, uh, ways of of you know interacting in the environment and uh, so the the one that was I think talked about the most which was fascinating to me was the star nose moles which we'll, we'll talk about so um, I guess my, my first uh, question straight out the bat is why did you decide to write a, this book and you know were there I was curious when I was reading I was like oh, is there I wonder which animals didn't make the cut were there other animals you wanted to talk about or you know why did you focus on these guys in particular so just kind of tell us what was the the inspiration for for writing it yeah so you know I've been doing research on these critters for a long time and I guess part of the inspiration was I feel like I've seen these really incredible things and 
I wanted people to know about it. You know, that when you publish the research in, in these science journals, um, and you know, it's not that they don't get covered to some extent, but the full story of what's going on with these animals and what the discoveries are, and also the backstory. You know, science writing for a technical publication is really kind of dry, and it's yeah. and you're, you're sort of encouraged to do it that way and not express your awe and your and, and you know just how amazing it is to see some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I wanted to bring that to other people. And one of the things that I I tried to do in that is really bring it to them by putting in these QR codes that link to the movies. That was super cool. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I haven't seen that in many uh, uh, books, even popular science books. And I did look up some of them and it was really cool. It really like brought the the animals and kind of some of their features alive. That was that was a super cool thing in the, in the book. Was that your decision or that was with yeah. the publishing or? Yeah, it was my decision. Um, I just thought this is easy to do now, you know, that with the mm -hmm. way technology is, all you have to do is aim your phone camera at it and it takes you straight there. And I, I just thought it was the kind of thing, you know, there's a, there, there's one thing is the cool factor. You know, I'm, I might describe, oh my God, you can't believe how fast the Starnose Mole is, or oh my gosh, this is electric eels will come up out of the water and shock stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think the text, you know, there's something to be said for your imagination being really good at sort of envisioning these things, but being able to see it is something else. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted people to be able to see it partly because it's cool, but also partly there's a flip side to that, which is sort of the data side almost, you know, it, I'm a, you know, in science, I really, if I say, Hey, this is what's going on. I, I don't want to just show a graph. You know, mm -hmm. I, I want to be able to say, look for yourself. This is what I'm talking about. And you know, you can see it for yourself and, and, you know, actually, in, in some of the papers I'll, I'll put in the movies as well. And that allows other scientists to, if they want to reanalyze it, look at the experiments differently, that kind of thing. It's, it's helpful for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Yeah. It's, it is a, for folks that are listening with, you know, hopefully you, you, you get the book and it is a really cool feature uh, to kind of like pull it up on your, on your uh, phone and able to look at some of the experiments that were done. There were super, I remember the, the one in particular that stands out is the one with the eel, which we'll, we'll get to. It's a super yeah, cool yeah. video. <laughs> um, so with the, just a general question again, what is these creatures are odd, I guess, in terms of uh, some of the more well-known and well-talked about uh, animals that we we see like on a nature documentary or something. And what do you think overall are, you know, do these creatures describe uh, here that tell us about evolution in general? And are there any uh, convergent uh, evolutionary effects with some of the traits that you describe? Uh, and how does adaptation work uh, in these animals? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a big question because, you know, evolution is sort of weaved throughout all of what's going on with these these animals. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is that, you know, from, for the sort of the personal side is that these are kind of anomalies or outliers. Mm -hmm. So I find them really attractive in that sense, because they're mysteries and, mm -hmm. or, and, and, you know, exploring a mystery is really kind of fun and, and uh, rewarding if you can figure out what's going on. Um, it can also be frustrating. Mm -hmm. And for me, that all started very early and sort of what, what's these evolutionary products, like what's going on with them? That started with the Starnos mold back when I was an undergraduate and I was working as a volunteer at the National Zoo. And, and so it was this long standing question, how and why did the Starnos mold evolve? So that sort of kicked mm -hmm. off my research and I got a taste for these outliers and anomalies. But one of the things I learned when you talk about, you know, what's going on with the evolution of these things is when you look sort of from the 30,000 foot view, sort of the, the outsider's view, these things look so strange and so hard to explain. Mm -hmm. But when you really get into the research and you start to not only look at the animals, but then start to compare across other animals that are related, and then you dig down into the literature to see what other people have done, almost inevitably, a really interesting story of, and I should say, explanation for what's going on tends to emerge. Mm -hmm. so I'll give an example with the Starnos mole. It's this really crazy looking animal. It's got these yes. appendages on its nose. There's yeah. nothing else quite like it. So you would think, but when you look microscopically at its nose, it turns out it's covered with these little 
domed sensory organs called Imer's organs. So that's your sort of first, you know, pulling back the curtain a little bit mm -hmm. that tells you something about what's going on. And then you look at other moles and you find, huh, there's 30 species of moles and virtually all of them have these little Imer's organs. Mm. So the tip of the nose of moles is about these Imer's organs. So you start to get a little bit closer to the explanation. Hmm, there's something going on with Imer's organs, these little touch sensors. And you know, to make a long story short there, what seems to have gone on with the star-nosed mole is it's gotten incredible resolution by expanding the number of these sensors into these finger-like appendages and making them smaller so that if they were sort of pixels in a camera, you'd have more input and smaller receptive fields or greater resolution. And, and there's a lot more to that story, but um, that's one example of how you know, you start to dig down and you see these that there's similar things out there that are that the mole is not as unusual. It's still really weird and still does an amazing yes. number of things. But um, there there's more out there that's similar than you might guess at first. Hmm. Yeah. It, one of the things that you talk about with the Starner's mole is, is that uh, along with shrews is that they're not technically mammals, right? They're in, they in, actually they are mammals. But they, they are mammals. Yeah, they are mammals, but they are you. I think you notice they're insectivores, so they're mostly yes. insect eaters. But you know um, what? They usually get people look at them and they think, oh, they're rodents, mm -hmm. um, and they're actually very distantly related to rodents, even though they look like so. They are kind of unusual mammals in yeah. that sense. Um, and I, you know what? You know, going back to the evolution side of what's going on is, you know, mice and rats and cats and, and a lot of mammals we're familiar with have these whiskers that are mm -hmm. really important. So we don't have these whiskers, right? So, but you look at a mouse and you don't think, oh wow, how strange is its face? You think, well, that's a mouse face, right? right. It uses whiskers to find its way around. Right. Well, one of the changes that went on with these weird moles is that they started using the skin surface of the tip of their nose instead of whiskers to explore things. Hmm. And that kicked off the evolution of expanding the fleshy part of their nose, which led to the star. Hmm. And, and that I can tell that story because there's intermediates that have almost hmm. a sort of proto star type thing. Hmm. So, so, you know, if you looked at a, a, a rat with an incredible number of whiskers, you'd probably just say that's kind of a, you, you, you know, a, a special, somewhat special rat, but it's not totally bizarre. Mm -hmm. But if you look at a mole with extra appendages, then it looks really bizarre. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you if you look back at the explanation that the tip of the skin surface of the nose is the main sensor, mm -hmm. that's sort of part of the evolutionary story there. Yeah, it's 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 super cool, and it's you know we never get the whys really answered in, in biology. So, well, why this mole and not you know the other twenty nine you know species of them? And sometimes it's really hard to answer those questions. But I guess the one question I do have is in terms of insectivores, you know, how does their where do they fit kind of on the phylogenetic tree of of mammals and other insectivores? Is this just an outlier, or how does you talked a little bit about the intermediary species, but how does it fit and how we understand kind of the taxonomy of of these types of uh, uh, mammals? They have been uh, a tough problem for the taxonomists. <laughs> <laughs> the name insectivore uh, was what they call kind of this trash basket, kind of throw everything weird into that grouping. Mm -hmm. and so the moles and the shrews and hedgehogs and this weird thing called the selenodon um, kind of all got put in there. And then when people started to be able to do the molecular biology to work out the phylogenies, the, a lot of the animals got sort of taken back out. And now it's a grouping that's mainly these moles and shrews and these weird Cuban selenodons and the hedgehog, which is another weird one. Um, so then you're getting into sort of the trivial, uh, the trivia of, you know, exactly what's going on with each of these species. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I haven't kept up with their latest revisions of other than that grouping of four animals, uh, you know, four families. I haven't really kept up with what's going on with the latest revisions. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. There, there, there are other animals in the animal kingdom that will also, you know, people will debate, you know, where, which, which grouping do they belong to? And it's a kind of an ever evolving uh, process. Uh, this is just a, a, a kind of a, almost a footnote of a question, but early in the book, you talk about how you, I think you were talking about one of the uh, experiments you were doing or field study and that you, when you were finding the, the star nosed mole, uh, you were looking at all these tunnels underground and that 10 different mammal species shared the same underground highways. Um, and how do, I guess my question, I never, I don't know this at all, but that is interesting to see like completely different 
mammal groups that are sharing the same kinds of, you know, tunnels and, and underground uh, burrows. How does that, how does that help us understand, I guess, the environment of which this mole is sharing with other uh, 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 mammals? It's not just by themselves, right? They're, you know, hey. they have, they have their, their environment is a shared space. You know, how do we kind of understand them? Yeah. So there's sort of two answers to that. And, and one is a lot of that for that specific case is still kind of unknown and mm -hmm. something I would love to know too. But then there's sort of more general probable, here's what's going on as a theory of evolutionary biology is that usually when that's going on, each of these creatures sort of carves out a little specialist position so it can take advantage of one part of the environment or one kind of food item and not the other. And that does seem to be what's going on. So that one of the amazing things in those tunnels is this little tiny itty bitty shrew called a masked shrew it weighs about as much as a penny. And it's so small. It's amazing. You know, when I first saw these guys, I'm almost embarrassed to say, you know, as an undergraduate, I wasn't thinking really about the, I thought, oh, this is a baby shrew, but it was running around, you know, it's fully furred. It's eating, it's, do, it's, it's dispersing, it's doing it. It's, it was an adult, but of mm -hmm. course I was imagining it. It must some, somehow must have been a, a juvenile until I could identify all the species. So it's so tiny. It's one of the smallest mammals on the planet. Mm -hmm. Now it probably is also one of the fastest mammals on the planet and that probably relates as you as you know to the brain structure that sort of gets discussed a little later so one you can be super fast and go through all these little tunnels and small crevices that the other guys can't go through um, but then there's this other one called the short-tailed shrew and it's got poisonous saliva and it's like the i kind of think of it as like the grizzly bear of shrews because <laughs> it's a bruiser and it and it can it can it, it can eat mice and it can eat small snakes and it can take down a lot of stuff with its venomous saliva. Hmm. So basically each of them has a little bit of a different way of living. The starnose moles, they seem to specialize on these super tiny prey items. And so that seems to be what's given them their, their special ability is, is so that they can eat small things fast and find them with the star. Do, do we know what there is there any conflict? I mean, you have 10 different groups of mammals or do they ever like just kind of bump into each other in the in the in the tunnels and they just have it out and just have a brawl or, or, or is it mostly pretty friendly or I mean, you would think, right, there's a bunch of, you know, different types of mammals using the same kind of highways that, you know, there's going to be a, a, a traffic jam or an accident or someone's going to bite someone or eat someone or or is it pretty, you know, they cohabitate well. I have no doubt there's lots of conflict down there. The one that you see the most is the weasels, which are the top wow. predators. So I don't know if you yeah. quite call that conflict so much as carnage. Um, you know, mm -hmm. the weasels all prey on all these other guys. And, and um, you know, so they're probably the top predator and they can make it down into these tunnels. And, you know, who knows really how many escape strategies these guys have for getting away from those guys. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that you start talking about, it. so let's talk about the star nosed mole. So kind of just tell us about its, uh, unique anatomy and its functions. They have, uh, let me see if I get this right. They have 22 appendages, right? Yeah. Is there, you know, any reason why it's 22 and that it's, um, it's not used for smell. It's not electroreceptors. There's no chemical detractors. It's a huge sensory organ. Yeah. For touch. So it's like this like crazy, like ability for touch way beyond probably what humans have and other animals have. So how can you kind of tell us about its anatomy and its appendages and the touch piece and all that stuff? Yeah. So it's great to be able to, to relate this to something that we're familiar with. So our hands have about 17,000 touch sensitive fibers that, mm -hmm. that basically mediate what are really known to be something that underlie our evolution, which is the ability to manipulate objects, make tools, these days type one computers and so forth. Mm -hmm. Starnose moles have like five times that number of nerve fibers. They have 100,000 nerve fibers in their nose. And that nose is about the size of your fingertips. So if you can imagine, wow having five times the sensitivity of your entire hand concentrated to one fingertip, that's sort of what it's like to be a star-nosed mole. Wow. And it gets crazier than that because, you know, this is a sense of touch. And yet when we started looking at this in slow motion, this little tiny sense organ acts like an eye. And by that, I don't mean that it detects light. Rather, it's got this central portion that's high resolution and this outer portion, which is these the outer parts of these appendages, that's low resolution. So when it's scanning its environment, looking for something to eat, 
it'll find something sort of just wondering if it's something interesting by touching with the side part and then move to the center part for mm-hmm. repeated touches. And that's a lot like what, you know, if you're reading a book, for example, you're constantly shifting your eyes from one word to another. Or when you look at someone's face, you're, you're moving your eyes to, to move that high resolution part around in your environment. And, and it turns out this is pretty much exactly the, the way that the Starnos mole is using its sense of touch. And then it gets crazier from there, because if you look at its brain organization, that parallels the same kind of dominance of the central high resolution part the so-called fovea, mm-hmm. in the same way that our brain and our visual cortex is dominated by processing that central high-resolution bit of touch. Mm-hmm. It's 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 absolutely fascinating. So, kind of going back to so so so, there's the idea of touch that it's a it's a sensory organ. It's a huge sensory organ and huge in terms of you know how sensitive it is, I should say, um, but also you know very small. But then. The, the speed of that is nuts. It's 120 yeah. milliseconds is the average or the yeah. fastest, which is yeah. faster than the human eye blinks, which is, again, incredible. Yeah. So, so it's, 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 move, it's sensing things faster than we blink, essentially, which, you know, just say how you like figure that out and, oh, yeah. and why that's important. Yeah. So, I mean, that was crazy too, because, you know, here I'm looking at this thing acting like an eye, but, but it was very hard to make out the movements without getting my first high speed camera to Mm -hmm. be able to film it about a thousand frames per second. So then I was like, okay, now I've got every little detail here and I can describe the, the eye like sort of similarity of this touch organ. And then I started thinking, well, wait a minute, why am I using a high-speed camera? Why is it so fast? And how fast is it compared to other, you know, I hadn't, hadn't really done, this was just a convenience thing in the beginning. And then eventually I realized, well, I got to measure the actual speed and see how this compares to other animals. And when I measured how long it takes them to touch something, move to the center part, touch it a few times more, decide whether it's something worth eating, eat it, and then start looking for something else. That was where you get on the fast side, 120 milliseconds, which is just a little bit over a 10th of a second. So hundred milliseconds is a 10th of a second. And that's just phenomenal. So phenomenal that honestly, and this has happened to me a lot, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I was, I literally was, you know, and here's this engineering camera that people use for, you know, military explosive kind of research. It's definitely calibrated. Right. But I was still like, I'm going to go test the calibration of this before I can believe that an animal can be that fast. Hmm. And that's the kind of thing that I love when I'm doing my research. I mean, you, you know, you might think that, um, when you look at these animals more and more, you kind of get used to it. And it's the complete opposite that the more that I look, the, the crazier it gets and the more interesting it gets and the more inter- the more sort of mysteries get revealed. Hmm. Yeah. It, I mean, I, I read that in the book, I, I probably read it three times and I was just like, no way, there's no way like that can't, that can't be, you know? And, and it's super interesting how the world and different organisms have you know, we think we're pretty cool and we are cool in some ways, humans, but there's each animal has, you know, something that's super insane, like to, to marvel at. It's just, it's wild. Yeah. You, you also talk about the development of the appendages, right? That they have this wild backward sequence, you know, so tell us yeah. what that is and what makes that so unique. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's another great part of this story, which is, you know, people have wondered how could this thing possibly evolve? Mm-hmm. It's so complicated. It's so unusual. It doesn't seem like it has any intermediates. And so when I started wondering that myself, I, I, I eventually decided that, you know, the way that people do this in evolutionary biology, that's really helpful. One thing to do is to look at all the other animals that are related and see if there's anything that looks like an intermediate out there. Mm-hmm. And out on the West coast, it turns out there's a mole that has a protostar. It's sort of like, I like to joke, it's the Archaeopteryx of moles, you know, that famous <laughs> fossil that's intermediate between yeah. you know, reptiles and birds. So, you know, in my little sub world, it's, it's got that status. Um, but anyway, the thing, the, the part in terms of evolution that gets really interesting there is Stephen Jay Gould sort of, you know, one of his very influential early books was ontogeny and phylogeny, mm-hmm. which is looking at the relationship between development and evolution. And one of his main points there is sort of a long story there, but the main point is that there are really good clues to how something evolved in a lot of 
developmental sequences. And so that was sort of the next step in this story. So I've got this proto star that's sort of an early looking star kind of structure on this one animal. Then you go to the embryos of a star nose mole to try to add in some extra clues about this evolution. And it turns out that the embryos, which are completely crazy looking. Um, yes, are, I remember this in the book. The picture in the book is like, it looks like something alien. It's so wild looking. It is so yeah, wild. It, they are really, really strange looking things. Um, but they, the nose part looks like this adult structure in this other species. Hmm. So it, it turns out to be like a poster child for what Gould's entire book was about, which is that in some developmental sequences, there are remnants of the evolutionary sequence. And that is the case for the way the star nose mole develops. And, and it, so what, what you were talking about with the development is basically the appendages start out folded backwards on the face of the mole. So they, they kind of get developed in place facing backwards. And then right after the star nose mole is born, they bend off the face and flip forward. Hmm. And it's a completely crazy developmental sequence. It's a kind of sequence, and this is another thing that evolutionary biologists will, will talk about a lot, that you would never develop from scratch. Like if you were an engineer and you're like, how am I going to make a star? You would not choose this method. Yeah. And the analogy is kind of like the way a flounder develops. If you were going to develop a flounder, you wouldn't drag one eye over the, you know, to the other side, which is actually this crazy developmental sequence for a flounder. Um, but this is the way star nose moles do it. And it makes perfect sense if the ancestor had these strips of sensory tissue on the side of their face that over the course of evolution, eventually bent forward to form the star. Hmm. And part of that evolutionary sequence seems to be retained in the developmental sequence. Hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a crazy way to understand in, in its development how it, it gets to have its most unique feature, right? Which is yeah. which is terribly fascinating. So let's let's talk about the uh, the neocortex. So so just for for listeners, a little bit of a, a reminder here. So in humans, the neocortex is responsible for skilled movements, right? So humans have the posterior cortex, which is for sensory information, prefrontal cortex, which some people know for planning movements, premotor cortex, which has Broman's area six, organizes movement sequence, and primary motor cortex, which has specific movements. At the subcortical level. The basal ganglia is involved in executive function of controlled motor movement. For the mole and the shrew, how is their neocortex, so I, I've just described very briefly some neuroanatomy for humans, but for the mole and the shrew, how is their, their neocortex different in structure and functioning for their planning of fine and gross motor skills that are unique to them? So they have a really interesting story in terms of their brain. Um, less is known. We don't really know what's going on with the basal ganglia and the planning of the movements, but where the neocortex gets super interesting, both for shrews and moles is sort of in two different, there's two different stories there. Mm -hmm. For the sternos mole, so one of the big challenges in brain studies, especially neocortex, is actually getting really accurate measurements for exactly where the borders of these areas are. Um, and, and, and so in the case of the star nose mole, you can actually see a star in the mole's brain when you properly stain the tissue, That's which horrible. is, it's really kind of a, re a remarkable thing to be able yeah. to see a star pattern. Yeah. It's, it's like if you looked in the human brain and you saw a hand. Yeah, yeah, where that's the hand wild. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's it's really interesting, and and just and and so that pretty much reveals the 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 organization that I described, where there's this mm -hmm. huge part for the most for the fovea that's the most important part. I mean, so you, so you can see the different appendages and and so forth. So that allows for a, for a bunch of kind of detailed studies, but one of the things that it taps into is this long-standing question about how do our brains differ from other mammal brains? So all yes. mammals, all mammals have neocortex. So of course we're really interested in neocortex, rightfully so. Mm -hmm. um, and yet 
the, an interesting question there is what was it like in our ancestors? Where did all this come from? Yeah. You know, these cognitive abilities that we have, what kicked it off? What was the ancestor like? And that's often debated, but, but shrews are extremely similar to the fossil ancestral mammal condition. And so one of these things that we try to do, this is sort of a, a whole area of neuroscience is sort of this comparative evolutionary neuroscience mm -hmm. where you're trying to figure out how brains evolved and what the ancestor was like. And you can guess that one of the problems there, and this is true, is that you're not going to find a fossilized brain. No. It's not like you're going to be able to go in and find the cortical areas and so forth. There's actually, nice. It'd be very nice, but it would be very nice. I mean, I should say there's, what are called endocasts, which are sort of filled skulls that mm -hmm. give you the shape of the brain. Mm -hmm. but it doesn't tell you what's going on internally in the neocortex. And so one of our best ways of trying to figure out what happened there is to look at the most similar animals that still exist that are like the ancestral condition and sort of put that piece of the puzzle into the picture with these comparative studies that tell you, you know, what's a conserved brain area, what's a new brain area. And so shrews are, are an important case in that point. I'd like to give the analogy that it's kind of like, let's say you have a tough math problem. Sometimes when you plug in zero or infinity, an extreme case, you get some clarity in this math problem by sort of looking at the variables in their extreme ends. Mm -hmm. And the shrew is one of those extreme ends, meaning it's got a really small neocortex. Okay, so all that preamble is to say, well, what's a shrew neocortex look like? It's got just a few neocortical areas all shoved together. Like I sort of, in the book, I call it the Gondwana land of neocortex, meaning that you know, before everything's separated out, it's possible that this is really representative of what the ancestral condition may have been like, where we have, we have multiple touch areas in our brain, multiple visual areas, multiple auditory areas, and we've added language areas and multiple motor areas. We, so our brain is extremely complicated, probably a hundred or more, well more than a hundred cortical subdivisions. And the shrews have maybe five or six. Mm -hmm. And so they look like a, a very early sort of case of what the primitive early mammals probably looked like just these few well-defined areas that have very little intervening in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because there's, you're absolutely right about, we don't have enough, you know, kind of set in stone kind of fossilized brains. And yet we know that there's the, the spacing for the parts for the brain, uh, different parts of the brain. So like you're saying, you know, mo all mammals have a neocortex, right? And they all have, there's certain parts of the brain that is just consistent with all uh, mammals. And it, it's interesting in terms of movement because you have the neocortex, you have the basal ganglia, you have the cerebellum, and they're all doing different things. Now, obviously for humans, cerebellum is implicated for many things. Um, and so there's there's this interesting overlap, right? This kind of convergence of, well, how do we understand, um, you know, kind of kind of what you're saying, these, these mammals that are still alive today that kind of are similar or, or not too dissimilar from early mammals. And then how does that help us understand just mammals in general, but then also obviously humans. Is there anything we know about, um, you know, how underdeveloped their basal ganglia is, the moles, um, and how much that's implicated in their current motor functions, or we just, we just can't get there? We haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. So much to do. Yeah. <laughs> ba basal ganglia is such a cool, cool part of the brain, uh, at least in humans. So it'd be interesting to see how, how it looks uh, different um, in, in other mammals. So go ahead. Oh, I will say that one of the things that we do know from these kinds of studies is that's kind of amazing is those neocortical cortical areas that I described mm -hmm. are the same homologous areas that we have. Hmm. So I sort of left out a little bit of the story there, meaning that the touch area in a shrew is the same area that we have in our touch area, hmm. our primary somatosensory touch cortex. Mm -hmm. And the visual area is the same area, the primary visual cortex and same for auditory cortex and motor cortex. And, 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 you know, so how would I know that you might ask, like, how do you know it's the same area? Well, that is by looking across the brains of all these different mammals 
And the same way that you might say for a finger bone in a mm -hmm. mammal, well, how do I know the finger bone in a bat is the same as the finger bone? In, I mean, well, you look at all the intermediates and you say, what's the shared characteristic there? Right. And so for me, that's really kind of stunning. When I look at this little tiny shrew brain and I say, well, we share these cortical areas. And what we've done in the course of evolution is to add tons of areas in between these. Mm -hmm. And I just, I find that, you know, a really compelling sort of way of looking at the evolution of the mammal brain to look at that extreme. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's spectacular because we're seeing that there's a kind of skeleton, if you will, there's a kind of shelf, if you will, of what a basic, uh, for invertebrates, what a brain structure, you know, spinal cord and brain, and there's a, a kind of um, outline of what that looks like and so some may have only a few parts we have many 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 packed in there but this the the outline of it is um has a lot of convergence which is again just spectacular um the other thing i want to ask about this is that their ability to carry air in their lungs and they do this, this thing you talk about this bubble blowing and underwater olfaction i mean that's nuts i mean just describe it for us and what do you think is the adaptive uh, feature for them being able to do this yeah so that you know that was that was another one of these um it's almost like dominoes falling in terms of discoveries when you start to get on the trail of one of these things mm -hmm. so that followed from the high speed video of the starnose mole trying to understand well you know it dives it's it's interesting animal because it dives to look for food in the winter and, and 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 in the summer sometimes and so i wanted to know is the touch ability degraded underwater because it's you know much more viscous sort of so what goes on underwater so i put a high speed camera on these animals and look and what a, what you can see is they're exhaling these air bubbles and then re re-inhaling the same air bubbles and this is essentially, you know, this is one of those things where you have to you have to watch this long enough and start really pondering what's going on. And eventually, it dawned on me that this is basically what sniffing is if you were doing it underwater. And you know, you can't see sniffing in air, of course. Where you know, mammals do this all the time, but you'll never see it. But once you're underwater, you can see these air bubbles come out and get re-inhaled. Mm -hmm. And with that sort of first clue, then I set up these scent trails. And sure enough, they can follow scent trails underwater, doing this underwater sniffing of blowing an air bubble out, re-inhaling the air bubble, blowing it out, re-inhaling it, um, which is just, you know, an amazing workaround because it was totally logically thought impossible that you could smell that a mammal could smell underwater mm -hmm. most whales and have degenerative olfactory systems you know how are they going to do this but but these little mammals that are semi-aquatic can do this underwater which was a complete surprise yeah it it, it was a surprise to me when i was reading it because i was like yeah how would they be able to do that underwater and then you kind of explain it, it was like wow that's that's absolutely fan fascinating uh, staying uh in the water um the water shrew right what is it about them that they have this you know insatiable appetite uh what does their feet anatomy tell us and um what, what is it important for them to catch uh, food underwater so i'm listing some of the the highlights of their features so tell us about the water shrew and, and some of their distinct uh features yeah, that's one of my favorite animals. They're really adorable little critters and super outgoing. And, you know, I think I joked in the book about how, you know, if you had a water shrew, you'd say curiosity killed the water shrew would be our, what it would be our saying if people had pet water shrews. Um, they're very inquisitive little creatures. They're the smallest mammal diver. So they can they'll, they'll basically swim for food. And they do have a really high metabolism. So do most shrews. And that's one of these. Um, biological trade-offs, uh, you know, by having a high metabolism, they are, and they don't hibernate, they are ready to go at top speed, full, fast predatory reactions at any time, night or day, winter, summer. And that you can really contrast with invertebrates that are not heating, keeping their bodies warm. Mm -hmm. And basically they're a lot slower especially when the water's cold, especially during the winter time. So you kind of have these, these trade-offs. So, you know, if you're the water shrew, you need to eat a huge amount to heat your body while you dive into cold water. On the other hand, 
you have got the reactions you have your it's like a miniature cheetah um just absolutely incredibly fast efficient predator um and that's the that's this thing i should emphasize they are pretty intense predators for their size they'll eat just about anything they can overpower so if you you know a little crayfish versus a water shrew the water shrew will take it down every time um, even though it looks like an intimidating encounter for the water shrew the water shrews are always going to be faster and you know that gets to warm bloodedness and what is good about you know, about having that higher metabolism versus being a, a, you know more dependent on the environment to to keep yourself warm as far as their their specializations for swimming they have these there it's funny they have a workaround for swimming rather than having webbed feet like you might think of a frog they have these interesting set of hairs that form these almost miniature paddles mm -hmm. so their webbing is made by fuzzy large feet it's kind mm -hmm. of cute really mm -hmm. And, and so th this, this, the, I remember you, there's a picture in the book about the, their anatomy of their feet. How is that helpful for them? Is it just a movement thing or is it helpful for them to also uh, catch uh, their, their it's meals on the water? It's mostly a swimming thing. Mm -hmm. um, so they will pursue fish uh, and other things underwater very quickly. So they have, they're again, sort of like the Starnos mole, their reaction time is super fast. They may have the fastest predatory attack that's ever been documented uh, they can underwater as well underwater yeah underwater so they can react to something in 20 milliseconds um, and bite at something in 50 milliseconds so that's you know a 20th of a second that they can actually bite at something um, and one of the problems with figuring out just where these guys all lie on sort of the records of fastest and slowest animals is not many people are looking across the animal kingdom at, you know, for these kinds of reaction times. But I would I would put my money on the water shrew being super hmm. fast, hmm. partly because yeah. of the brain. It sort of goes back to their brain organization. And I think one of the things, you know, when I talk about this in the book, one of the trade-offs that we have that people don't think about a whole lot is the fact that engineering a really big brain is a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. So we can do a lot of things with our brain, but the connections are longer. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's harder to get communication between distant brain areas without... So some part of our brain being large is not just cognitive ability. It's also all the connections that have to fit into our heads Absolutely. to keep the processing speed mm -hmm. uh, appropriate once things sort of spread apart. Yeah. So there's a surprising benefit to keeping your nervous system small. Mm. They're not going to write Shakespeare, <laughs> <laughs> but they're really fast and efficient for what they do. It's uh, it becomes more expensive the the harder or the, excuse me the the longer you have to travel for information and connectedness, especially if you don't have as many parts. Um, so that would make sense to keep it small. Uh, and I was going to ask about the neocortex. What what can we say about again, kind of like with the the star nosed uh, mole? What can we say about the neocortex for the water shrew and its ability to hunt on the water? Like you're saying with these quick reactions, um, you know, if they can't barely see. Um, are they simply just relying on other senses, you know, texture and shape and movement, or how, how do they kind of do this underwater? And what's the uh, implication of the neocortex? For them, it seems to be mostly about touch and water movement detection. They actually use their whiskers to detect water movements. Hmm. Um, so that's one of their workarounds. And we don't know exactly what's going on at the neocortical level. There's some evidence that they might be doing an almost sort of reflexive kind of attack using the lower parts of the brainstem and not as much of the neocortex as a sternos ball uses. Mm. Should be an interesting sort of work around there. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so the kind of in the middle of the book, uh, you talk about two other uh, animals, which uh, most people will probably see as similar, although they're maybe in shape, but uh, definitely some distinctive things about each of them. So we have uh, snakes and eels here. So the first thing you talk about uh, is the tentacled snake and how they eat fish. And uh, so how do their tentacles work? What is it about them that makes them distinct from other uh, snakes? And how do their tentacles uh, work as kind of these water motion sensors? Yeah, so the, the tentacle snake is a really, it's another one of these anomalous outlier kind of critters where 
you know, it's the only, it's the only snake that has these tentacles that are sticking out the front of its face. It's also a water snake. So it basically never comes out of the water, gives birth in water. And it's one of the sneakiest predators that I've ever encountered. It's got this trick where it'll sit really basically camouflaged hold very still and wait for a fish to swim to just the right location. And then it essentially twitches a part of its body that is on the opposite side from the snake's head. And that'll startle the fish towards the strike, which follows just a, a, a fraction of a second later. So the, the snake's sort of trick is to essentially, you could sort of say it, it uh, practically scares the fish into the snake's mouth during the flight. Because <laughs> it's from the other end of the body, closer to the tail, that's yeah. making the movement. So yeah. then the fish is like, oh shit, there's something coming over here. I'm yeah, going to go yeah. the other way. And then yeah. because of how the snake is positioned, it just goes right into the mouth of the snake. So it's the ultimate uh, deception. Yeah. Yeah. And the insidious thing about this is that there's almost a reflexive what's called an escape response by fish. And this is, this is one of these model systems in neurosciences you know, probably you, a lot of the listeners wouldn't know, but a lot of the circuitry and the way that neurons interact has been worked out in these smaller species. Um, and fishes are one of those that have been a so-called model system for understanding how are some neurons inhibited? When are they inhibited? What, what's the way that uh, the, the, that electrical synapses or chemical synapses interact to produce a response. Long story short is that this escape response is really heavily studied and it happens very quickly, almost automatically. And that's great for the fish because it can almost sort of run on autopilot when there's an attack that it will suddenly move out of the way of that attack. And that's great most of the time unless you run into one of these tentacle snakes and that then this sort of automatic ref, practically reflexive circuit kicks in and it sort of will aim the fish in the wrong direction and at that point the fish can't turn around mm -hmm. and this is one of those times when the qr codes in the book are a must see yeah, yeah. When, if you look at the uh, sort of the way that these fish are escaping straight into the snake's mouth it's really kind of phenomenal to see that yeah, it's just quite the marvel. I remember it was one of the ones I looked at and I was just like, you know, what am I watching? <laughs> how yeah. is this? How is this happening? You know, it's, it's so uh, it's so interesting. And, and what is the I guess the also with this tentacle snake, the significance of the optic uh, tectum? Uh, yeah, yeah. Is, it's, it's similar to the star nosed mole in terms of their eyes are moving quickly. But, you know, how did how does the that aspect of uh, the, I'm glad the you snake, brought that part up because it's, yeah. you know, it's um. So one of the things that's sort of true of nervous systems in general, true for us, is that we are constantly integrating or putting together different senses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you look at a bird or a squirrel or your dog or a television set, for the most part, you're putting together visual cues and auditory cues. Right. And when it's really critical, sort of life or death, like you might have a car coming or or you know, you think back to when there were more predators around that even we were worried about, you want to orient properly to be able to immediately assess what's going on. And that works the best when information is combined in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, when you have a visual and auditory cue, for example, coming from the same space in the environment. And that happens in a brain structure that for us is called the superior colliculus. It's one of the main places that it happens to guide our orientation movements. Mm -hmm. And that same structure is found in many of these other species and it's found in snakes. And in snakes, it's called the optic tectum. And what this tentacle snake does is it detects water movements with its tentacles that indicate there's a fish there and gives it information about position. And at the same time, it can see the fish and it puts that those two bits of information together to get sort of the perfect targeting for distance and position and movement. Mm. And so by integrating those two things, and this is what happens in the optic tectum, basically there's sort of, it's a layered structure and usually the superficial layers will have the visual information and some layers below that will have, in this case, the water movement information. And it'll put those two things together as sort of a, a, a way to get the very most accurate information. 
And we're kind of doing the same thing all the time. When you make your eye movements, those are often based on what your superior colliculus has processed for something you want to look at when you shift your eyes. It's again, when you look at the size of a snake's head and you, how is that features, you know, it has to be so small in its brain, how it's, it's just an absolute marvel that it's able to do that or to have that feature, but then to do that and then do that underwater, um, you know, is, is again, it is, it's, you know, that's its environment, right? So it lives in water, but still it's, it's, it's again, very, very much a, a marvel to, to see these kind of features in these, these animals. Moving to the eel, um, can you describe the, the eel's electric organ, which has these uh, electrocytes and how they work and what is, you know, active uh, electroreception and all that, all that wonderful stuff? Yeah, that, I mean, this is one of my favorite animals on the planet. It's just, yeah. it's yeah. hard to conceive of this animal even existing because yeah. it gives off hundreds of volts of electricity. And you have to wonder how could that possibly come about? Mm -hmm. and, you, and I wouldn't, I'm not the first one to sort of make that statement. Of course, now we know mostly what's going on with it. But Darwin wondered about how the heck could you have an electric eel evolve, you know, because it's so unusual. Well, the starting point, I think, for thinking about this that's helpful is just think about any television hospital scene with a beeping heart monitor. Mm -hmm. So, so it, we know, and, and you're aware if you, if you see that scene, that muscles are giving off electrical pulses. And so that's sort of the starting point, uh, that there's these electrical pulses that muscles generate when they're active, and you can record them off the chest of a human. So they're obviously sort of coursing through the body to some extent. And it turns out in the history of the, this sort of um, different senses that some animals have evolved the ability to detect electricity in the environment. And this is a sense called electroreception. Other animals sort of took that starting point and ran with it and started to be able to detect their own muscle contractions. Now, I should say this is always happening in water. So this is with an animal fish that, that have a conductive medium around them. And some of these fish eventually developed muscles that were no longer for contracting, but they just amped up the current, so to speak, until they developed an electric organ and used this as a radar system. And so there's a bunch of electric fish. And in fact, there's quite a number that you'll see in pet stores. And a lot of the time people don't even know that they're electric fish. Now, everything I said so far, these are usually weekly electric fish that you could pick them up in your hand and you wouldn't even detect their electricity. But a few species have gone even further and gone from this sensory system where they're probing with electricity to sort of weaponizing it. And that's the story of the electric eel, which is its relatives, which is very worked out who it's related to. And in, in South America, there's this, a lot of these small electric fish. Um, basically, it, it went from a small electric organ just for sensory purposes to this huge electric organ by adding these cells that are called electrocytes that generate electricity, essentially adding them in series. So imagine you had a flashlight and you just kept extending your mag light and adding another battery. <laughs> you know, you start with three and when you're done, you have a couple hundred. Um, that's sort of the evolutionary process of the electric eel, which is why it has an eel shape. So it can fit all of these. It's like the super mag light of electric fish. Um, so it can fit all these in. It, was this just to, to, to scare off uh, predators? Is it to catch prey? Is it to, we don't know? What's its kind of function, its evolutionary function for, I mean, there's not that many animals that have it at the magnitude that they do. So it, what, what about it in their environment is the case? I mean, what is it that is kind of the central, quote unquote, you know, reasoning or adaptive feature for, for, for this? So I guess what, what is the, the, the central f adaptive feature for why the eel, the electric eel, has this? Is it, is it just for to uh, scare off predators? Is it to catch prey? Is it to, uh, is it we don't know? Uh, is it something in its environment? What, what, can, what answers or best answers do we have about this very unique uh, animal? 
that is such a great question because what is going on with that electric organ is really phenomenal and it's it's something that's almost obvious in retrospect uh, but is still super cool which is it gives off its electricity impulses and people have always sort of just said okay the electric eel can use this electricity to stun prey or to deter predators and that makes you know a lot of intuitive sense but the details of how it does that is amazing. Basically, each time it gives off a pulse, this electrical pulse spreads out through the water around the eel, and it enters the body of nearby animals and activates their neurons. So it's like a force field, almost. In a way, mm-hmm. and, and, and almost a way to think about it, or really a way to think about it, is it's acting like a taser. Mm-hmm. But it's acting like a taser that has evolved to be even better at its job than a typical taser. And by that, I kind of mean that um, ultimately it's remotely controlling animals using electricity. And it has two ways of doing this. One way is to just sort of blast them with a volley of electricity. And what that does is freezes up all their muscles so they can't move. So this is a hunting strategy that prevents other animals from escaping. So it's like temporarily paralyzing them, essentially. Absolutely. Temporarily. With with, with other animals in the water, fish, et cetera. But, you know, what about if if I'm, let's say I'm walking on the beach or where, where, you know, I'm walking on uh, in a a, a river and this thing, uh, I get near it and it, uh, I feel the taser, I feel the shock. What's it going to do to me as a human, I guess? Or or are there larger mammals? You know, size is no defense against an electric eel. So all. really, so, yeah. so my, my leg would go numb. You would, if you were immersed in the water, like say you were swimming. And this is one of the things that this is probably the most dangerous thing about electric eel. And in, in my estimation would be, you would be sort of tasered and unable to move. Really? Yeah. So you would be basically frozen up the way, uh, as if you had been hit with a police taser, but possibly even more so because an electric eel has evolved to optimize the sort of signal for activating the muscles of nearby animals to, to quickly and efficiently freeze them up because nobody's ever sued an electric eel, you know, for doing it like, (laughs) you know, just just sort of overdoing it. So they're, they're good at doing that. And it's even more amazing than that because they have a, a sort of different twist on the system, which is let's say there's hidden prey. And so they hunt in the Amazon for, things that are variable and hidden in various places. Mm -hmm. So one of their tricks is to sort of swim up to something that they're not sure whether it's alive and hiding somewhere and give off a blip of of high voltage electricity. Mm. That instead of freezing up an animal causes a massive whole body twitch. Interesting. And that twitch generates a water movement and then they can detect the water movement. They know where something is, they know it's alive, and then they follow up with a full-on high voltage follow. Hmm. And that's just the beginning. That's just scratching the surface of what wow. they can do. Wow. Well, some of them is, it, it, the, one of the other things I think you mentioned in the book is these uh, neuromasts, right? Which is this yeah. dual modes of prey remote control. So this is a little bit of what you're, you're saying here, right? Is how they're able to sort of control the animal they've they've uh, shocked or, or whatever, yeah? Yeah, so the neuromasts are the name of the water motion detectors. So this goes right back to the, so there's, I love the question because there's a lot of generalities in the biology of all these animals. So, you know, I described that the tentacle snake uses tentacle movement and vision and it's integrated. Mm-hmm. Well, the electric eel is doing a very similar thing and it's using water movement information and electrosense to integrate this. So even though it's a bizarre animal with really unusual senses and unusual abilities, there's still this thematic similarity across species. So it's integrating what it gets from the water motion with what it gets from the electrical input. And, and, you know, that opens out of the door because I'm saying with what it gets from the electrical input, well, what am I talking about? It turns out the electric eel is using its high voltage not only to remotely control other animals, but simultaneously, the high voltage is a radar system. So it is able to use this electric output. It has these electric sensors on its body, and it's freezing up the animal with the or causing it to move, depending on what, it, what its goal is, and at the same time, detecting where the animal is with electricity 
and at the same time detecting it with the water motion sensors from its sort of you know convulsions as it shocks it and so it's just a, a phenomenal sort of combination of unusual abilities and adaptations to the extreme that we just could never have really imagined you know previously I, I mean it's again it's 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 absolutely fascinating I, I, just a a follow up here um i mean again i don't think any of us really know but just your best guess how much you know there's plenty of, of of folks that are writing about this you know about animal consciousness and stuff and in 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 the the mind of the eel how much do you think it's aware of what it's doing like it's aware of its abilities it's aware of what it's doing and it's i'm going to use this you know in air quotes but volitionally doing this you know how you know you, you've worked with these these uh, animals i mean you know your best guess what would you uh say is could be said about that I mean, how, on their awareness and volitional kind of you know way of doing it boy that's a deep one <laughs> uh, you know i might turn it around on you i mean gosh, i mean uh so it's certainly voluntarily done i mean they can you could sort of say they emit electricity at will mm -hmm. so the but they'll also have sort of this time when they're kind of resting and it almost looks like they're gonna if you disturb them they're just immediately going to give off electricity um but sort of the consciousness and the the you know how much are they aware of this um i don't really know how to answer that one um i think that that's a really intriguing question um i almost go back to humans you know and and getting to what is con you know the first we have to sort of say what is consciousness yes, and yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and it's, uh, a, it's a messy question but there's yeah, it's, a it, it's an it, interesting it, one it's like that uh that old paper now why am i drawing a blank on the name it's that big seminal paper you know what is it like to be a bat um yeah, and yeah. it's and it's that idea of it's it's it, you know franz de does some of this stuff too about you know how 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 smart are we to know animals because of we're using always using human instruments to measure something that's not human or, yeah. or an animal that's not human. So we're always kind of at a disadvantage here, but it, it, it is something, whether, whether we know it or not, it is something um, to be like that animal. They have a, a, a way of which that is. And obviously we don't know it. I don't think we can simulate it per se. We can know many things from, uh, from behavior, but, and so I wonder, you know, with such a unique animal, any animal really, but such yeah. a unique animal. Yeah. No, know, I mean, how conscious is it of what it's doing? Yeah. And, and I mean, it's, so one of the things that I say and, and that I think is true is one of the reasons I love this case is because it's one of the, the electric eel in the electric sense is because it's one of the bigger challenges for us to even try to conceive of what that's like. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, if I say, well, Starnos mole has this phenomenal sense of touch and it has this hand-like organ with high sensitivity. Well, you know, you can at least kind of conceive of that. You can right. imagine, you can set your hand down on the table and say, what would it be like? Even a bat echolocating, mm -hmm. you know, that's another level up, but still you, we know what it's like to hear. Mm -hmm. Some people who are blind have learned how to echolocate, you know, yeah. so that's that's a little bit out there, but it's not completely inconceivable. But sensing with electricity is really different. It's yes. really different. Um, and, you, and, and giving off electricity as yeah. a muscle activity. I mean, so, you know, when we reach for something, you know, we're activating our muscles. They have the same output system. You know, you're talking about motor systems. It's a motor system, meaning it's a it's the same neural pathways that would activate a moving muscle, except they use it to activate electricity. Hmm. So I just love I love the question because it's kind of like, you know, try to try to imagine that uh, it's hard to do, but it's intriguing. Yeah, it is super intriguing because it's there's not that many um, animals that are 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 doing this right there's not that many animals that, that do this and the eel is super um, unique uh, earlier this year I read this book uh, called the book of eels oh yeah and great yeah it's a great book because it I didn't I just picked it up and I was like yeah eels are cool and I don't really know anything about them and the book turns out to be kind of like half memoir like yeah. half like you know na you know natural science kind of uh, writing 
and um you know kind of just details this history of like people all the way back to like greek philosophers that were like puzzled by like this animal yeah um and darwin was puzzled and many people were puzzled by and we're still puzzled by this animal that does something super distinct i mean and 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 so my question is you know you write about uh, the eel in the book and and just it, it's one of those things where it's like well what is it like to be that animal you know just just such a such a totally different uh, way of doing things but yet there are some components that have you know with, with convergent evolution things that are are there as well that we understand from other animals and so again it's a it's a mystery and it's a it's a wonder but it's just deeply fascinating. It's funny that there's just still so many things you don't know. I was going to ask about one of the really cool QR codes I, I looked in the book was the one where you do the experiment with the the eel on your own arm. Just kind of tell us a little bit like yeah. what that was like and what, what yeah. that felt like and everything. Yeah, that's that's that one has kind of got multiple dimensions to it as well, but they might be more human dimensions. <laughs> um, so that was trying to solve a puzzle a physics puzzle and basically um you know working with electric eels one of the things i loved about it was okay they do all this amazing stuff and that's great but it also got me into trying to work out the electrical circuitry and what i really loved about that was um as a biologist and an animal behavior person you know Animal behavior is very unlawful, but the, the physics side of electricity is very lawful. So you step into that world and um, it's a really fun sort of set of experiments to work out what's the resistance of the eel's internal battery? What's the voltage of the eel? What's the current that the eel is giving off? And all of these things can be solved for. And what I was trying to do with that experiment is understand this defensive behavior that the electric eel has where it comes up out of the water mm -hmm. when it feels threatened and pushes its lower jaw against the threat and gives off high voltage um <laughs> which is another thing that it can do this is when i remember i said like they can do so many different things sometimes i lose track well that's one of the ones i forgot to mention like it has this leaping defense where it comes out of the water and and under the right circumstances will will try to give that off so having discovered this defensive ability, I wanted to basically work out the puzzle of the circuit that develops, the electric circuit that develops when it comes out of the water and how you could calculate each of the different currents. And um, I ran into this really kind of funny situation because I had worked out every variable in this circuit and except for one, which was what happens at the target. And I thought I would be able to get that last variable without a direct test, um, which means I would have failed my physics 101 circuit exam question because uh, it was these two resistors in parallel, which any physics electricity person would know you need to know both of them to get the current out of that. So anyway. Uh, long story short, uh, I eventually realized that by using my own arm, I'd be able to figure out how to solve for this final variable. And so that's what I did. And I should preface it with, I, it was a small electric eel. Mm -hmm. So I, and, you know, I wasn't subjecting myself to the huge sort of somewhat more dangerous electric eels. And, uh, I guess I like to say it worked perfectly. <laughs> how, how did it, I mean, I don't know. How did it feel? I mean, so the, so the only thing you're out of obviously water and you, you're you just having your hands submerged and it comes yeah. up. So, you know, but what is the sensation like? You know, it's like a cross between a taser and electric fence. <laughs> <laughs> kind of joking. I mean, it, it actually is. It is. Um, if you've ever worked around an electric fence on a farm, for example, uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's very similar to that. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, to be more serious about it, it is. Um, an extremely uh, efficient way to essentially deter an animal in in sort of a uh, uh, almost like a deceptive way. I want to say hmm. uh, it's sort of like a scam. They're 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 activating your nerve fibers, but they're not causing any damage. Hmm. So you know, if you were to take your hand and set it on the table and hit it with a hammer, 
very obviously that gets communicated to you through the nerve fibers in your arm, right. up your brain. Well, the, if the electric eel can, using electricity, activate these nerve fibers, which it does, um, it's going to send a signal to your brain that says, whoa, something extremely bad just happened. Um, and, and uh, you know, so it, uh, it, it was deterrent. <laughs> it was efficient. It wasn't actually that bad. Hmm. You know, there, there, there's um, a lot of toys out there that are, you know, will give off shocks and games and electric games and things like that. So it's sort of an amped up version of one of those. But if, if, if it was, do you think um, a bigger eel and you were completely underwater, I mean, it would be Serious. Pretty, pretty scary. I mean, yeah, it would be. And, you know, yeah. one of the things is right after I published that paper, or one of the early papers that there was a video on YouTube that came out showing a fisherman have this in, in South America, uh, come up on its chest, oh my uh, goodness. On its chest. and it, it did everything you'd expect. It basically froze him up. Oh my goodness. The guy fell over and then the eel sort of followed him to shore and shocked him. But the guy got up, he was fine afterwards. And, uh, so this, in the moment though, that has to be terrifying. Again, again, yeah, it, sure. it, most people are terrified of snakes. And uh, it looks like an underwater snake. I mean, it's not, but it looks like an underwater snake. Yeah. And that thing just comes up at your throat and just paralyzes you for whatever. I mean, just that's, you know, you bring up a really good point in terms of you were talking about animal cognition and what's the sensations and these sorts of things. Once I did walk, take a step backward on a farm and I, and I touched the electric fence and uh, there was a horse in the field, even though it wasn't very close to me. And because the sensation of being shocked is unlike any other real, real sensation, it, it's terrifying. Like had, if, I was a, if I was a kid and I was like, hey, I'll give you five bucks to touch that, it would be a lot less disturbing to do that, knowing what you were doing, than to get shocked and not really understand what's going on. Mm. So when I backed into that electric fence, I thought I'd been kicked by the horse and paralyzed like my, like my back had been broken or something oh my goodness. like that. Yeah. But really, all that happened is I got shocked by an electric fence. And I say all that because I think that there's a component of the electric eel's deterrence that for most animals, just being shocked like that is going to be when you have no conception of why, you know, you can't do the human thing that I understand what's going on. And you just have all these pain receptors activated. Mm -hmm. I think that would be an incredible deterrent, even if it didn't cause a lot of damage. So that's just my speculations on that. Yeah, no, I could, I could definitely, I could definitely see that. I guess with well, the the last animal that uh, you, one of the last animals you talk about in the book, and the last one we'll talk about here, is the uh, female jewel wasp, which is uh, super fascinating. It's uh, able to make zombies, which is uh, pretty wild. Um, I'm kind of using that colloquially, but. Yeah. The the females only uh, are the ones that are zombifying, if you will, uh, the cockroach, right? Now, most people don't like talking about cockroaches. They have a really big aversion to them. But I guess two questions for that. Why is it only the females and not the males? Yeah. And why cockroaches and not other insects? Yeah. So you've tapped into... Um what I call my Halloween lecture. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> so that's how I got into this, this side of this particular problem is I was looking for something really creepy to teach about on Halloween. <laughs> and, you know, I love the movies and the videos. So I brought some of these to, to my lab and um, it turned out to be pretty cool. Cause like any biology question, does things start to fall out of looking at them that you wouldn't expect. So the story there is, um, it's a story that will make you feel sorry for a cockroach. If there was anything, you may <laughs> doubt me, but um, the female jewel wasp, in order to reproduce, has to, they're, so they're what's called a parasitoid. Um, so basically, their, their method of reproducing is to, well, it's kind of straight out of Alien, you know, just to give you a reference point. Like they need something to eat. And they are specifically for their young develop in, in on and then in a cockroach. So what happens is uh, the, the female jewel wasp, the only way that she can reproduce, she's evolved to target the American cockroach and only the American cockroach. And so the challenge that it has, though, is it's got to sort of subdue this big cockroach 
and bring it to a hole where it's going to barricade it in, just like sort of Edgar Allan Poe type story, and lay an egg on it, uh, just like out of Alien. And, um, you know, she can't carry the cockroach. So how is she going to get it from wherever she finds it to this hole? So she's got to basically pacify it, but keep it able to walk so that she can kind of bend it to her will and pull it to this, this death chamber or crypt. And she does that by grabbing the cockroach. And there's this sort of rodeo that goes along as the, as the cockroach tries to get away, but she'll sting it in between the front legs, briefly paralyze the front legs. And this is where things get, you know, science fiction esque. She'll, she'll then sting it directly in the brain. Mm. The positive venom. The, the brain of the cockroach. The brain of the cockroach. And she can only. so small. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, 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 it. I mean, you know, when we talk about evolutionary complexity, mm -hmm. behaviors and adaptations, this is top on my list. It's, uh, yeah, the amount of accuracy you have to have for a cockroach's brain. I mean, yeah. that, how, how small is that? I mean, small. <laughs> I mean, we're talking less than millimeters. I mean, it's super small. Yeah. And she has to do it while struggling with the cockroach. It's like a surgical strike, Unbelievable. like a neurosurgical strike, deposits the venom in the brain. And after that sting, the cockroaches, the they literally say this in the papers, and I say this in my papers, it's they make a zombie out of it because it's then sort of bent to the will of the wasp, so to speak. It will no longer try to escape. It'll sit there and groom itself, but it can still walk. If you put it in a wind tunnel, it'll still fly, it'll swim, but it won't try to get away. And then the wasp will go off and sort of prepare the hole, and the, the cockroach will just sit there for half an hour. Then the, the wasp comes back, and trims the, will actually clip the antenna of the cockroach and the cockroach still won't run away. And then it drags it by the antenna like a dog on a leash to this hole, lays an egg on it, barricades it in there. And uh, then this tiny little egg hatches on the cockroach. And then the rest is like alien. Basically, you know, the- uh, it Becomes a host, if you will. It becomes a host. And- uh, So it like kills it? from the inside out as it like hatches or whatever. Yeah. And it overtakes well, it's like carcass and like the whole thing. And yeah. And I got to tell you, if, if, if there's one movie in the book to, to look at, this would be the QR code to, to scan. <laughs> yes, yes. Set up this whole little diorama of a Halloween setting uh, with this whole behavior. And you can see the whole thing from, you know, one end to the other of the wasp doing this in a really interesting way. Um, but anyway, so once the egg hatches, it actually, the little larva feeds from the outside for a few days and then burrows inside the cockroach, eats the cockroach alive from the inside, forms a cocoon inside the cockroach. And then uh, an adult emerges sort of a la alien bursting out of the cockroach. Yeah. It's okay. So I have, I have many questions. So sure. <laughs> the first question I have is, okay, what's in the venom yeah. and what part of the brain, I don't know how anyone could do this, but how do you, how do we understand as much in the brain of the roach, which parts of it are kind of, it's not even going offline, but like, it's enough to like sedate it, if you will, but the other parts of it, it doesn't like how, like that's wild yeah. to me like I, I don't how do what's going on in there like do we just not know any of this stuff like what's in the venom like if you got stung by that venom right. you'd be fine and or other animals but like with this like how did that i guess you could say in some ways some well it's not co-evolution but there's this way where they're like the venom of the of the uh, uh wasp and the, the cockroach like it works so that way the the wasp can control the roach but maybe it wouldn't do that way if it was like a bigger animal like how does all that work yeah no i think it's great i mean i i think some some movie producers gotta <laughs> run with this story because you could imagine how you could have an interesting sort of uh you know take on this but uh so a lot of it is some of it's known, a fair amount of it's known. So the first sting, I mean, it is amazingly precise. So the first sting is even crazier. Um, it goes into uh, this one little set of nerve, nerve uh, sort of nuclei 
uh, that controls the front legs. And what's injected there is GABA, which maybe you've heard of. It's this inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it basically blocks the neural signals temporarily so that once these, the, like just the front legs are paralyzed, which is exactly what the wasp needs in order to then find the brain. So it needs to get the front legs paralyzed and then find the brain with the stinger during that little window of time. And it has little mechanoreceptors on its stinger and it uses this to find the brain. And then it deposits venom there, some of which is dopamine. Mm. And that is thought to cause the, the cockroach to start grooming itself. And that probably sort of distracts it from trying to escape. But somehow on after the first half hour, there's another set of neurotoxins or, or transmitters. We don't really know what that causes this long-term pacification that sort uh -huh. of takes over next. And I will say it will wear off in maybe 10 days to two weeks if there's no larva uh, hmm. that's the deposit it and eats it. And here's the crazy thing. Um, this isn't in the book, but I actually discovered just following the book that there's this new set of stings that nobody had noticed. So it's more than these two stings. There's a third set of stings. And the last set of stings seems to move the leg out of the way so that egg can be laid in just the right place. And I'm just, you know, it's a great creepy story, but it's also a story of Phenomenal. I think what you said is right. Like coevolution. You know, this is an animal yeah. that you know, if it was Shakespeare, it's like every wasp is of cockroach born. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which... And so it's absolutely dependent on this working every time, and it's been dependent probably for millions of years, and so it's honed this ability for this. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's head scratching stuff. You know how this is. Um, but I do think, so, so, you know, if I was telling this story about a star-nosed mole before I studied it, I'd say, I just don't get how this could have evolved. And, and I say that because until you dive in and do the comparative work and, sure. and, you know, the developmental studies and all the things that go along with this, there, you know, somebody might come back in years to come and say, well, now we know how this evolved, you know, mm -hmm. but right now I'm pretty dumbfounded, just like you are. <laughs> yeah. it's. Again, it's, it's just one of those things where it's like, how, <laughs> there's so many things on the planet we just don't know, and we find out these new things, and it's like, how is, how is that possible for two different, uh, I guess, insects to, to, I mean, it's not the same, it's not two wasps or two cockroaches, it's, it's, it's completely different, and that's, yeah, there, there is, I think, some kind of co-evolution there, but does does the cockroach defend themselves? Like, are they trying to? Are they yeah. trying to? Do they, do they put up a fight, or are they just like? Some them, yeah, some of them do, and uh, they they'll kick the the head of the wasp repeatedly. I sort of joke that it's the same strategy you take with any zombie making thing. You want to hit it in the head with a club. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They can deter them, um, you know, and escape this sort of awful fate. You know, but what you said, I think, is true. That's one of the things I love about my job in biology is, you know, there is so many things out there and we just so know so little about the diversity and, and what's left to discover, I think, is astounding. I'm sure there's just so many more stories like this that are incredible. In yeah, it, it's it is. I mean reading uh, books like yours and some of the, some of the papers and certain nature documentaries, you just, you know, your mind is, again, we talked about it before. You know, once you get <clears throat> certain forms of technology, you know, you're able to learn even more things and it's like stuff that's always happened. It's always been around us, but then we don't know it until somebody finds a fossil. Somebody does some really good, you know, science, somebody, you know, has some technology to fit. And that, that's what's, that's also what's crazy to me is that it's like, this stuff has been going on. This stuff happens. And, you know, how, how is that? Um, how do we not know that? How do we not, you know, it's just interesting how we're able to, to, to just realize these things. I was uh, talking um, uh, recently um, with uh, um, this uh, researcher that does work on cephalopods. And cephalopods are super cool. Yeah. And she gives this whole history on basically the 500 million year history of cephalopods and they're super ancient 
um, in many ways. And so I was reading the book and the book was great and she's lovely. She's, she's super brilliant. And I remember the book and then the conversation and researchers still are trying to figure it out. But there's basically three different types of, of cephalopods if you're three different categories, I guess you could say, um, there, there's derivatives, but, and one of them is the Nautilus, which has, has its shell. Right. It's, it's basically like, the, you know, it looks like they're kind of from mollusks. And so it has this shell and it's kind of sticking out and kind of, you know, curves. And I mean, there's a diagram in the book and it's kind of like a tree, right? Kind of have the, like the tree and all the different types and everything. The Nautilus essentially is pretty much unchanged since like at least 400 million years ago, maybe, you know, 350, 400 million years ago. So the Nautilus you'll see. And in the, in the ocean is been just, just, just swimming along pretty much in the same state for hundreds of millions of years. I mean, that blows my mind when I think about that. Right. And, you know, until people were looking at the fossil record and things like that, they didn't really know it. And then they started doing all this categorization. Like, wait a minute, this one hasn't really changed. You know, and no one knows, no one really knows. And, um, Again, it's just stuff like that. I mean, the stuff that you, you've been talking about with some of these different animals is is just absolutely amazing. So I guess my last question is, is kind of along those lines is, what can we make of all of these animals, some of them that are bizarre to most people? And what are we still learning about some of the evolutionary adaptations from animals such as these and and uh, anything else that you, you kind of want to say about some of these animals or other animals you're you're working with? Yeah, I mean, you know, the diversity of what is out there to still learn is phenomenal. I mean, we can, you know, there's sort of two different hats that biologists tend to wear sometimes, or certainly if it's sort of in neurosciences. And one is there are a lot of so-called model systems that you can learn basic generalities from. So, you know, I didn't mention it, but the electric eel was absolutely pivotal in the history of science in terms of first understanding electricity hmm. and actually isolating the channels, some molecular channels that, that mediate muscle movements, the acetylcholine channel, because it has so many of these. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing is going on all the time. In crayfish, people discovered the electrical synapse. Mm -hmm. So there's lots to learn about basic science that's absolutely, you know, sort of pivotal stuff in these diverse animals. But then there's this sort of second side to it for me, which is, you know, I would want to know about them anyway. You know, no matter what it might do for sort of, you know, medicine or just, just the idea that, you know, if this was, if you were, if you were thinking about astronomy, you know, you think of the Hubble deep space image and you, you, you know, you look out there, you don't know what's going to be there, but I'm really glad that they looked, you know, and that they found what 10,000 galaxies in this little time and what that tells us about the universe or what, or taking images of black holes you know, these might, these things might not impact us immediately, but they tell us about what the world around us is like. And I think that that's true for these animals as well. I mean, the, the things that they're doing and just how incredibly specialized they are, um, I think that really needs to be appreciated. Just it's, it's, it's as good as fiction, you know, people are yeah. just so yeah. into science fiction and what's actually happening out there is I think equally phenomenal. And of course, it's actually true. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Well, well, well look, Ken, uh, this has been absolutely wonderful. The, the book is called Great Adaptations, Star-Nosed Moles, Electric Eels, and Other Tales of Evolution's Mysteries Solved. So where can people find your book and um, where's the best places to, to pick it up and uh, to read all the wonderful things that you're uh, documenting here? Yeah, it's from Princeton University Press. You can get it from their website. It's on Amazon. So wherever you want to buy books, I think you can you can easily get this. Um, there's links to it in the QR code, code movies as well. Mm -hmm. So if you come across those. That'll take you straight to a uh, place to buy it. No, that's, that's great. Uh, Ken, this has been such a blast. I have so much fun talking about this stuff. Uh, you're a great guy. You're super brilliant. And I just really have loved every second of it. So I just can't say enough. Uh, oh, thanks, thanks to you. Thanks so much. It was really great to be here. I really enjoyed it. All right. Thank you. 